Most people have tried a flight simulator or perhaps game software that involves flight with a joystick. But to make it a realistic flying experience, the gear must approximate the real thing, being heavy, almost clunky to a degree. It must have weight and tension as if control cables are being pulled and durability like most aircraft controls have. After all, a poorly built throttle control could spell disaster during flight, even if the parallel flight simulation is only a disaster of embarrassment. Welcome to the world of the TASC, I'm not sure how you're supposed to say it, task flight simulator that I designed and used X-Plane as the software. This is the yoke. This thing has all view buttons and fun stuff on it plus instructor entry buttons. The yoke is how the plane goes up and down. Pulling back makes the plane climb in altitude. The steering sets the angle the plane is flying at to the horizon. With the view buttons, the pilot can see 360 degrees around the plane. The instructor can reload the aircraft, other runways, even weather conditions with the 123 button codes. It started out as a PVC pipe T on the end of a PVC elbow and a T at the base. I cut out three layers of plexiglass discs, one with limits for the steering. The structure needs to be tough for kids so the layers are bolted together and rides on an aluminum plate. This turning section will rest above a potentiometer. The weak potentiometer is just linked to the discs so there's no strain on it at all. It is mounted on another layer of plexiglass further in. The steering wheel mounts onto the two bolts, which will turn the layers and pot, but will stay rigid in the aluminum hoop. Here it is all together. The support structure is welded 1 8 inch steel to be durable. The steering head is part of a thing called a yoke. It must rock back and forth, as this is what controls the plane's elevators. As with the steering, there's an embedded potentiometer to send this data to the simulator. As an add-on and additional pilot control, some sort of view buttons must be mounted to the steering wheel. Sometimes one needs to look left or right or remove the cluttered gauges for a clean view while flying. A gutted toy keyboard seemed a good choice for parts. The button pads were broken up to fit the new round shape, then embedded into some plexiglass, wiring and all. I had some old rock band drums I pulled the board out of and saved. It's like a joystick, but only buttons. Perfect. The board was cut down and fit inside the steering head, then the button panel connected using a heat coiled cord. Mounted in place with some hand-drawn graphics, it looks not bad. As you can see, steering is just fine. Now if only I could learn how to fly better. Just as important as the yoke are the foot pedals below. These control the rudder while flying, plus the brakes and the nose wheel while on the ground. Firstly, because legs are a lot stronger than arms, the base must be strong. Some heavy wall pipe was welded to a steel plate that would act as the base. Next, a piano hinge is welded on, along with some spring tabs to mount and pull in the pedals themselves. 
rocker assembly, I'm kind of proud of, has two rounded and polished stainless tips that ride smoothly over some plexiglass tracks. This must be done as airplane pedals, unlike pedals in a car, must work together. One in, one out, and the other one in, and the other one out. Like on the yoke assembly, a potentiometer sends position data to the flight simulator. Shortly after I sent pictures of the pedals to the project manager, Dobie, I was informed that a set of brakes must also be controlled by the feet. This was a challenge to start, but mounting the brake pedals on the end of the rudder pedals seemed to solve the problems of different leg lengths and keeping the unit as one. I used a unique method of position monitoring for the brakes. These are very high loads, so load cells would have been nice, but given time and monetary constraints, necessity beckoned invention. As can be seen, the bars are pressing into some sort of sensors. You may be surprised to discover only a pair of LEDs and photocells were used to sense braking pressure. The blue blobs are melted pop bottle caps to protect the delicate sensors. Here's the finished pedals mounted on the adjustment rails. This is the throttle quadrant. This is for your trim. This is for your throttle. And this is for your propeller pitch. And there's two of them, of course, because there's two engines. And this is the mix, which I won't turn all the way down because it'll stall the engines. The throttle quadrant posed a bit of a challenge because connecting to the controls wouldn't be linear. Using slide potentiometers like the ones on a graphic equalizer was my first choice. The problem with those in this environment is they tend to get dirty, then eventually malfunction. After much thinking, I decided to go with an LED and photocell method, like the brake pedals, but much larger. The LED and photocell, or CDS, mounted inside a piece of wood dowel. As the reflector and other dowel gets closer and further, the voltage will change. The movement of the connection point varied from one to the other, but all are around three inches or so. After some tests, it was surprising to see how linear the response is. Here you can see the reflector inside the unfinished sensors. Some of the curve variants had to be aligned in software, but all in all, this seems to be a very reliable method of analog data acquisition. the brake and it's the main brake I guess W brake here's a really cool brake uh, handle I made it's out right now I think that's parked and I'll push it in it's got it's kind of hard to push in but that was that request now it's oh, in yeah. oh yeah and that would be really this is really nice. loud I've got a little slide in here, and you can see there's a nick in the shaft, and there's a lever switch right in there that only goes out a little bit, but it's quite a bit on a small scale, and it rides down in that little truck, and then it's back out again. I don't know if I can get a better view here. <laughs> yeah, well anyway, so it's freaking awesome. This is a weight, uh, an exercise weight, part of an exercise weight handle, and I use the rubber end caps. And inside this is steel rod, about a little smaller than this, of course. Mm -hmm. I drilled it, threaded it, and found this piece of square rod and threaded the end on the lathe, or spun it on the lathe and then threaded it to quarter inch. And it's 
pretty solid. You'd have to purposely twist it this way to unscrew it. So, and that's the little stop there, and the rubber stop up here. So there it is. And these are ignition keys to start each engine. And when this turns off, it shuts off the whole uh, the whole flight simulator shuts down after a minute or so. The ignition keys look simple enough, but a whole lot went into making them control the main power down sequence. And the request by Barry, our resident pilot, was less than two weeks before the finish date. Because these switches are also used to turn on the battery and avionics in the plane, as well as start the engines, a bit of circuitry is needed. The relay switchboard is to switch the keys away from the main control box when the simulator isn't powered up. Instead, the keys turn on a large relay in this box, located aft in the plane. This relay connects the 120 volt mains and also the 12 volt batteries that power all the planes at lighting and low voltage gear. The relay is big enough to drive a 1000 watt inverter if need be. Because the computer must power up automatically, some modifications were made inside of its power supply. This will allow the control box to properly start up or shut down the computer, depending on where the ignition keys are set. Circuitry had it to be added to the control box as well, of course. This is the annunciator, and um, it's pretty dark, so you can see some of the lit that aren't supposed to, but um, these light up for warnings. Um, they also tell certain status, like you can see the brakes going out there, and uh, other things like when you're stalling. This is a test button to test them, make sure they're all working. And this is to turn off the master uh, warning. There's an interface bus for the enunciators and the flaps and landing gear when you lower the flaps this uh, the leader here goes down slowly as it comes down and uh, starts out at 0 degrees and 15, 30 and 60 eventually gets to 60 you use those for landing I can't show you the landing gear because I'm on the ground right now I pull it up just get a warning, but uh, they generally flick up to these LEDs. Usually not at the same time. Okay, and uh, there's an, there could be another five other LED sets. Driven things run off that box before I gotta make another box, so there's room for expansion here. Even though at this time there's only about 24 active indicators in the system, there will be more in the future. This gave me a chance to try out one of the chips I bought for another project I'll be doing in upcoming months. This board can handle up to 64 LEDs, so the box should be local to the dash area so there won't be a potential rat's nest of wire in the future. The LEDs are matrixed 8x8, so these little buses are the start point, then sets of 8 LEDs can be daisy chained from one display to the next. The warning enunciator uses two sets, and interestingly, one LED is an opto-isolator, that drives a piezo speaker. When on, the speaker beeps at the scan rate, which is luckily within the warning beeper frequency range. <laughs> the big rectangle LEDs were from the scrapyard, originally panel indicators for the mill, I think. They are so bright and perfect for the job. Some careful plastic work, and voila, an annunciator panel is born. The landing gear flaps panel was much simpler to make, of course. Here it is in action. This is the bus on the main control box. That's one bus. The other bus is right there. And there's another bus on this side in there, believe it or not. The thing's covered with buses. These are for calibrating. Calibration buttons. And inside the box, there's a Mega 
board and with the Ethernet um, interface on it and another my interface board in there. It's kind of hard to see there's so much stuff in the way now. There's a couple of little power supplies in there too to help drive everything. The control box is the heart of the system and I would like to think it was fairly well planned out. On three of the sides there's buses, each pretty organized, although some minor changes were made as the project moved forward. There are quite a few spares on this side for future development and additions. The inside started out simple enough, an app mega board, an ethernet shield, and an I.O. buffer filter board as I don't believe in directly connecting microprocessor pins to real world nasties like static electricity, cell phone emissions, people hooking stuff up backwards. That actually happened the night before, the first day of the Tex-8 aerospace camp, believe it or not. None of my stuff fried, but the computer's keyboard was cooked completely. On the back of the box are sockets to interface with the computer, a USB programming socket, a socket to control the computer's power status, which isn't in this picture, and of course another bus. This one for more switches and some digital I.O. From the simple idea to the somewhat more complex stage it's at now, the control box is pretty cool. And my pride and joy is the Navcom AI. This uh, little puppy let you set your transponder frequencies and um, I'm just going to leave it at 7-7. Seven, seven. Oops, 7-7. Seven, seven. It's not supposed to go past 7s. Seven, seven, number 7s. And uh, it also is for navigation. It's got two navigation frequency controls in it. And calm. There's two of those, two different ones. And ADF for finding airports. Right now it's on ADF 99. And this is a secondary one, secondary frequencies and stuff. For if you want to click over to those. And that one's on ADF on 555 transponder. If you want to turn it off, you have to go to off and then you push this and you can see those little LEDs are no longer flashing. That means it's not transmitting or receiving information from the airport. So everything's in standby now on that front, but it, you can still control this. As soon as you do that, then it comes back on again magically. Okay, so there's my Navcom AI. Yeehaw. The Navcom project went surprisingly quickly considering how much was involved with it. First I had to pull the LED displays from a scrap board because it wasn't configured right for this use. Next I had to learn the odd chip that was on the original board to interface it with the PIC microcontroller so the Navcom can talk with the control box. Next, make the boards for the pick and for some RGB LEDs. And finally make it so it would all fit inside this tiny plastic wall wart case. It looks great on the dash, doesn't it? Hidden, but not forgotten, is the dual monitor mount. This mount must be easily removable for transit, but solid and flush with the dash. Because there's no room at all, the original mount couldn't even be considered, so off to the welder to fab something up. The whole bracket is guided into a stainless plate as shown here. It then snaps into place once seated properly. The tab is lifted to pull it out. After a paint job and a polish, the mount is ready to try out on the dash. Perfect fit.
The levers for the flaps and landing gear were pretty easy compared to some previous parts of the project. The flaps must have light stops on the way down, but the landing gear is either up or down, we hope. A heavy spring on the axis of the two handles will keep tension for the stops and ensure some rigidity. The frame is welded steel, so no worries there. I added a center with foam to increase the resistance even more. With an aluminum cover, it becomes a thing of beauty, even though it's low next to the pilot seat, kind of out of the way. The two red handles are from a real airplane, but originally for fire equipment on that plane. Adobe, the project manager, wanted moving elevators and a rudder on the plane, so I reinforced a pair of servos to control them. They have lots of pull, but not enough to handle the pull of wind and transport on either. The rudder was connected with this arm and stainless rod that bent and twisted under the force. Too bad. I like these little guys too. It's little wonder as the rudder is six feet tall and the elevators are four feet each. So immediately I set off building this much more rugged linear drive set. These are rugged with a solid bar attached, which won't bend under the stress. This motor board is heavily constructed, so while motors may be overcome by strong wind, the mechanism won't be damaged at all. The connection box allows the whole thing to be disconnected with a single plug when the tail is removed for transport. To add realism to the flight simulator experience, I made a last minute addition to the project. This is what I like to call a vibrator and rumble board. It approximates the vibrations one might feel in a plane during certain phases of flight. Raising or lowering the flaps will start this little vibrator a bit bigger than the one in your cell phone. Raising or lowering the landing gear will start this coarser vibrator and going down the runway will cause rumble vibrations that increase with your speed. This effect was a real hit with everyone in the cockpit. Of course I'm not the only one working on this project. My 18 mini projects were just a part of the whole flight simulator. Way back last year, Adobe acquired a section of fuselage from a real DC-3 airplane. This would act as a template to form the rest of the flight simulator, now dubbed the Airbus 2, around. Two separate scale models were built by Dick to test the structure for various problems and arrive at solutions. This evolved the full-size structure that would be the airframe. Many aircraft gauges were donated by various sources. Westview Flying Club, Chilliwack EAA, and Texada's own KD Air donated gauges, radios, and nav gear, some still operational, and even mechanical aircraft hardware and brackets. Several individuals besides myself contributed time and materials. Jack built the throttle quadrant that I mounted the engine control electronics inside of. Jerry built the dash panels to house the instruments and gauges and was a key builder of the hull and let us use his yard to put everything together. He also supplied the trailer and truck to haul the whole thing around to different venues. Barry, a real pilot, installed the passenger seating area, panels, and lots of wiring for interior lighting, radio power, and navigation lighting. He also gave me advice on control systems and navigation instruments and was key in teaching flight at the aerospace camp. There was also Peter and Harvey who made the ramp. And of course Doby, who dreamed the whole Airbus 2 thing up. It's been an amazing project for all. Another project I did for the task this year, which could be regarded as a warm-up project for this one, was the task rocket launcher. Here's the panel. First the unit must be turned on here. The start countdown button initiates a countdown to launch from 10 seconds. 
countdown and status is displayed on the giant LED display. The abort button cancels this. Also releasing the dead man switch can cancel the countdown. The ammeter is to show current draw during a launch and show there's a connection just before the rocket fires. On the back, a standard 120 volt plug is used so a normal extension cord can be run to the rocket. There's also battery terminals to power the unit in the field. But why is there speaker terminals? This is for sound effects and a robot okay, countdown. The rocket launcher. I'll turn it on. It's, uh, fully digitized now. I'm going to do an abort mission um, because this will not be, this handle will not be turned, which is a dead man switch, and, but it won't be turned. So, okay, I'll start a countdown. Ten, nine, eight, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, three, two, one. So you can see by that that it didn't uh, it didn't go. Okay, this time I will actually launch a rocket. Okay. There's also a port button here. I'll show it here. Ten, nine, eight, eight. because I had the dead man switch on. There's supposed to be two There's supposed to be two of those, but you know there's only one because nobody can get me. Okay, this time I'll abort it. I'll abort the countdown. I won't have this on, but it doesn't matter. So I'll abort the countdown. There's the volume knob, you might plug in here. That shows the amperage when there is a load on here. I tried it with the vacuum cleaner, but it sucks it down too much. It makes it act funny. So. There you go. Oh, done and ready to go. My first project for TASK was the wind tunnel control and monitor interface. This is used to teach kids about aerodynamics and wind shape. The wind tunnel is always a highlight at the Tex-8 Aerospace Camp. I designed a nice graphical interface to resemble the cockpit of a plane. The display on the dashboard shows vital dynamics information such as airspeed, lift, and drag in a graphical format. There's also a vibration sensor. Via serial interface, the PC is connected to the control box, which gets data from the sensor pack. The sensor pack consists of two load cells, a piezo vibration sensor, and a propeller-type airspeed sensor made from a mouse wheel. It's on a plug so it can be removed. It's kind of delicate. All of the sensor data is processed in the rugged control box shown here during construction. Basic controls are on the panel with status indicators and buttons in standard industrial colors. The control box also switches the big wind tunnel fan motor and controls airspeed using these louvers that open and close. Here the airflow almost stops. And here, it's full speed. The louvers can be controlled by the software knob with a mouse or up-down keys on the keyboard, or by the panel knob. The sensor graph display is color-coded for easy viewing and can be zoomed to full screen. 
Data can be isolated by turning off other inputs momentarily, so you only see the one. And this is a new addition right here that shows the actual angle of the shutter. There, see it? It's kind of a little bouncy on the closing part, but that's just because the motor overshoots. So powerful. There's the lift and drag meters. And uh, those aren't doing anything because I'm not, there's no, nothing moving the sensors around right now. And this thing here is kind of like a pseudo airspeed thingy. Oh. The control box is the hub of activity. So there's a few wires plugged into the back, which looks complicated, but it isn't really. The mechanics of the louver was as much a learning experience for me as the wind tunnel was for the aerospace camp kids. I hope you enjoyed this presentation of the aerospace camp and all my projects involved with it. I'm Sandra Sims.